I want, I want God, God to, do to do that for me. me. I, want I want God, God to change the whole course, course of, of my life. life. I, want I want God, God to bless my family, my business, my career. But, but have, have you asked, asked what, what do those God, God want? want? When, when you meet His needs, 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 you, you will not, not have a need. You, you, you can, can live, live a life, life of excellence. You, you can, can live a life of continuous manifestations of the Holy Ghost 24 hours a day, seven days in the week. Glory to God. That's where I live. God, God is trying to pass on to us, us. in the mindset. mindset. Your, your mindset controls you. Your, your mindset determines the, the quality of your life in the, in the present and, and to determine the quality of your future. Your, your mindset. Your, your mindset, mindset is simple. It's, it's how, how your mind, mind is set. <laughs> that, that is it. It's the same thing. It's how, how is your mindset? So, so God, God here is, is dealing with our mindset. mindset. It, it means your, your heart, heart should, should be after, after him alone. Not, not after, after any other thing. thing. The Bible says he's a jealous God. Don't seek something else. Don't pursue something else. Let it be him. And everything about your life, from your education, your career, your business, your family, and everything must be hinged on him. The book of Corinthians said that they that live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them. Glory to God. God wants you to be addicted to him. God won't think about him. God wants you, your mind, your heart set on him. That's what he wants. I'm going to be talking about something. I will try my very best to be brief because it's quite lengthy somehow, but uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible. You know, when we talk about success, there's a lot of thoughts that go through the mind of people. You know, there are many things in life that give some feel of success. You know, some people think about success or rather they, they think they are successful or they see success in a new car and some in a new house, a new home and some they just became a graduate from school. I, I, th I saw all those pictures, beautiful pictures. <laughs> Glory to God. You have the sign on the shirt and all those things. It's nice, really. And for some of them, for some persons, more money in the account. And for some other persons, it's a successful business. And so we have different pictures when we talk about the word success. When we talk about success, there are different pictures that come to mind. There are different thoughts that come to mind. But all these are just sparks from the flame. I call it sparks from the flame. If you have um, observed the flame a little bit, you see some sparks coming from the mother flame, shining around. So it is not the true thing itself. It is an effect of something. Amen. Amen. Come on, you with me this morning. It's an effect of something. And all those things you talk about in this earth, the cars, the houses, the money, the family, the business, and all those beautiful things, they're all beautiful, nice, and beautiful, and lovely. But it is just a spark from the flame, the main thing. It's not the main thing yet. And I call them momentary success. It's for a moment. Mm -hmm. 
But man is much more than a creature for the moment. Man is internal. He's a spirit. And one reason I call a momentary success, it is because it ends here. Tell your neighbor it ends here. When you are out of this plane of life, you are not taking all those things with you. It doesn't matter the medals that you get. It doesn't matter how many houses you own. It doesn't matter how many friends you have right here on earth. It doesn't matter the physical things you've achieved. It doesn't, it doesn't follow you out of this place. It remains here. But in man himself is a quest. It is a desire for something much more than what he can see and feel. Something much more than what he can achieve right here on earth. And so all those things are beautiful. But it's not all there is. It's not all there is. This, there is a higher life. There is a higher call. There are things that um, God wants us to go for. You know, um, there's a simple principle that, that we also teach. That to have more, you have to be more. But if we talk about success just at that level, we would end up just being success teachers and motivational preachers and teachers. But the church of God is the grand and pillar of truth. It's much more than just do A, B, C to become successful. It's much more than that. The success of a Christian is much more than just the physical analysis, the putting together, that empirical knowledge. It's much more than that. The life of a Christian is much more than the, the whole stuff you can put together right here on earth. It's greater than that. And in these last days, God is calling us to get off the realm where we are to a higher realm because there's a higher life. Tell your neighbor there's a higher life. Tell your other neighbors, neighbor there's a higher life. But God sees things differently. He defines things differently. He doesn't see the way man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Glory to God. So no matter what you achieve right here on earth, no matter what man achieves, there is something more that he seeks inside. And the, the books and the teachers of the world can't explain it. It's something deep-seated in, in the core of his personality. God put it there. It's right there. And until you answer those questions deep within your heart, you won't start living truly. Life begins truly when the questions in the heart are answered. Those deep-seated questions, that inner quest, that inner drive receives light. That is when life truly starts. And so you would have to go beyond just what you see. We see Otro in the book of Exodus. We read about the man Moses, how that he was, uh, of course, he was in the river. The mother put him there. From the river, he went to the palace through a miraculous way. And then he became a shepherd. And then after that, he was before the burning bush. He took off his shoes. He was right before God. And then he suddenly became a deliverer and delivered millions of Jews. You will notice delivering the millions of Jews was not the main success itself. It was his encounter with God. His encounter with God was what transformed his life. Mind you, at first he was trying his very best to achieve what God had called him to do through his authority in the palace. God is amazing. He doesn't need you to be in the government house first of all before he can do what he wants to do. He doesn't need you to be the president first. He was a prince in the palace, but God got him out of that place and sent him to the wilderness to take care of sheep and the flock. And from there, he called him to deliver millions of Jews. Maybe in another man's thoughts, in a natural thinking, we would think, oh, come on, he's in the temple. Or rather, he's in the palace. He should just approach the Pharaoh and talk to the Pharaoh about the Hebrews and say, please, can you let them go? And probably just 
um, put together certain policies and uh, through the government system in Pharaoh's kingdom that favors the Jews and gets them out of captivity. Naturally, you would think that way. But God took him out of that place and brought him to the wilderness and took him through a process. And then after several years, one day he saw a burning bush and there was a voice out of the bush and God called him. And his encounter with God was what transformed his life forever. That is what made him the deliverer that he became. It is not some other thing. His encounter with God. So his encounter with God was his success. His coming to know God personally was his success. His coming to walk with God was his success. Some of you today, you are going to have that encounter with God. You didn't come here to meet with man, you came to meet with God. But some of you, when you leave this place today, you get home. You will start having revelations of the Holy Ghost. There, there are some of you, the Lord has been speaking for a couple of years now. He's been talking to you. But that voice has become recessive, sort of. Maybe activities of life has drowned it somehow. Now it's no longer clear. But from today, it gets clearer. You will hear the voice of God in the name of Jesus. His encounter with God was what changed his life. And that's what transformed him. And then he was able to deliver millions of Jews from captivity. There is something about an encounter with divinity. When you have that encounter with God, with the one you call Lord and Savior, you meet with satisfaction. Your inner desires are satisfied. You understand what it means to be satisfied. You understand what it means to have the peace of God rule and reign in your heart. Glory to God. You know, at some point, even if you read the, if you go to the book of Mark, there's something that happened in the, when Jesus called his disciples. The book of Mark chapter 1. Can we get there? Mark chapter 1. We have a couple of scriptures. Maybe we'll just read some. 1 from verse 16. Can we go from verse 16? Mark 1 from verse 16. He said, now as he walked, he's talking about Jesus. Now as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Imagine how Jesus encountered them. Amazing. And Jesus said unto them, there was no proud conversation. There was no conversation before now. I mean, they met a stranger. Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me. He said, I will make you to become fishers of men. Then what happened next? Go on, please. He said, And straightway, means they didn't think. The Bible says, And straightway, they forsook their nets and followed him. Straightway, they forsook their nets and followed him. Glory to God. Amazing. Let's go on, please. He said, and when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship, mending their nets. Take note of what happened. And straightway he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the ship with the hired servants, and went after him. Brothers and sisters, there was something these people met with. They didn't meet with a man. Jesus is more than a man. They met with divinity. They met with answers. Oh God. They met with solution. And when they met with the solution, when they met with true satisfaction, they forgot everything. Look at it. They forgot everything and followed. There was no prior discussion with Jesus. They probably must have heard about him somehow. They didn't sit down on the table to talk with him and to discuss how their lives will become. They didn't sit down on the table to talk with him to discuss how their finances would go. No, they didn't do that. There was no negotiation. When they met with life, their life was transformed. When they met with truth, 
They left the things that were transient. They left the things that were temporal. Oh. There's something we are doing in this generation. We are raising a generation of people that will love the Lord Jesus with all of their hearts. That would focus on Christ. When you look at the light, you will not see shadows. Men and women that would take their eyes off shadows and the transient things of this life and focus on the one true God, the one who called himself the way, the truth, and the life. He says, no man comes to the Father but by me. That's what he said. He called himself the life. Let's go back to, let's get to Matthew. Matthew 17. Oh, dear Lord, from verse 1. I, I love the story about the transfiguration. And after six days, Jesus took it, Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringing them up into a high mountain apart. Let's go on very fast. Verse 2. And was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Go on, please. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses, Moses and Elias, talking with them. Glory to God. It says, Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou will, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. Brothers and sisters, Peter had a family. Peter had a business. I mean, these people left everything to follow Jesus. Why? Because they met with something different. Oh, dear Lord. Oh, dear Lord. He said, let us make here tabernacles. Let's just remain here. Oh, when you meet with life, time ceases to be. Because he himself is eternity. Oh, glory to God. When you meet with this Jesus, you lose, you lose your consciousness of time. You lose your consciousness of these things, of this earth. And then he says, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, this is my beloved son, in whom I went, please, hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were so afraid. Next verse, and Jesus came and touched them and said, arise and be not afraid. Last verse, and when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Glory to God. See, he was transfigured before them. Brothers and sisters, most of us here are Christians. If you're not born again, you get born again today. You've heard about this Jesus. You've talked about this Jesus. You might even have preached about this Jesus. But it's not about talking about this Jesus. You need to know him for yourself. It's beyond just talking about Jesus. You need to have an encounter with this Jesus. When you come to know him for yourself, you will be like Peter. You start understanding why some of us are so addicted to him. So addicted. You start understanding why some of us can live everything just to follow him. Because his life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 You lose that thirst. The hunger is satisfied. The struggle goes. The strife dies. The reason many fail is because they focus on shadows. Your life is much more than to go to work and make a living. Life is much more than that. Life is much more than just trying to put one or two things together just to make your life beautiful right here on earth. Life is much more than that. When you walk that way, you are the man Jesus referred to. He said, come unto me, oh ye that labor and heavy laden. He says, you are laboring too much. There's what we call grace. 
The Bible talks about Jesus. It's a grace and truth. Oh, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Life can be easier. Life can be better. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You don't have a definition of your life until you meet with life himself. Oh, shout amen, shout amen. Oh, oh. The book of Philippians, Philippians, let's, let's round up very fast. Philippians 3 from verse 7. Let's read about Paul. Ah, I love this so much. He says, but what things, but what things were gained to me, he said, those I counted lost for Christ. I mean, this guy was a lawyer. He was well educated. He had many certifications and he was known in society. He was a big guy. They knew him around. I mean, uh, he was erudite and he was an apostle. And he talked about everything he had attained, a Jew with that and different things and all like that. Beautiful things that if you had that at that time, you were at the top of the crop in society. And then he said, let's get back to seven. Let's get back to seven. Verse seven, please. He said, but what things were gained to me? Those I counted lost for Christ. Why? Let's go on again. Verse eight. He said, yes, doubtless. I count all things but loss. Uh huh, uh huh. I read this long ago and I paused over here and I kept reading this. And I've been reading this for several years. He said, but for, but loss for the excellency, excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Excellency, excellency, the excellency of the knowledge, the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord excellency of the knowledge i mean this man left everything because of the knowledge of someone ha ah, how can you imagine this the excellency and then he called it the excellency of the knowledge he didn't say i left everything for the knowledge of christ jesus my lord he said the excellency when you talk about the excellency you are talking about the greatness you are talking about the the the, the overwhelming greatness Glory to God. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Glory to God. Glory to God. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. He means there's something about Jesus that we need to know. There's something about this Jesus. There's something about him. He's not just... Uh, 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 the, the figure we see in the book of Bible stories, there's something about this person. He's real. He's alive. He's not in the grave. He has risen from the grave and he's alive today, brothers and sisters. He's alive and he's right here with us this morning, brothers and sisters. He's right here. If you're sick in your body, that sickness can die even at this point. Glory to God. That pain can go. Hallelujah. Your life can be transformed. Glory to God. Glory to God. Yes, his presence is right here. Hallelujah. Who is this Jesus? The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. So it means that when a man comes to know this Jesus, oh, 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 every other thing seems to fade away. They fade away. Ah, but much more than that, who is this Jesus? And then I had to bring us some scriptures. The book of, can we rush fast? The book of John 8, John 8 from verse 56. It says, this Jesus talking. He said, your father Abraham rejoiced. Please, you need to look at this. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Ha! Ah. And he saw it and was glad. This Jesus talking to the Jews and all the scribes and Pharisees. The next verse. He said, then said the Jews unto him, thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. These guys got mad. They said, I mean, this, they saw him as a man. And then he used the same words that God used in describing himself. They said it's blasphemy. And then the next thing they did, they picked up stones to stone him to death. But he walked through their midst because it was not his time. And he left. He said, before Abraham was, I am. That tells us something about this Jesus. Ah, the Lord. It means that before the foundations of the earth, before the, ah, 
He's always been there. Glory to God. So Jesus is much more than just the man that came and walked and walked in the streets of Jerusalem and died and got up from the grave. No, no, no. He's much more than that. He's been before Abraham. Can, can we go on, please? The book of John chapter 1. John 1 from verse 1. Popular scripture. John 1 from verse 1. He says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You see, the same was in the beginning with God. Go on. It says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In this very scripture, he referred to Jesus as the word. Glory to God. And it says that the word was God. So, meaning that Jesus is what? God. It means they are one and the same. That's what it means. That's what the Jews were angry about. They said, we're going to kill him today. How can he make himself equal with God? But he said it boldly. He was confident about his identity. And this scripture further betrays it. So when you're talking about Jesus, you're talking about God. Let's go on, please. Go on. It said, all things were made. Okay. In him was life. Oh. And the life was the light of man. Go on, please. And the light shines in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. Verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came to, for a witness to be a witness of the light. That all men through him might believe. Go on. He was not the light that was sent to be a witness of that light. That was the true light that lighted every man that came, that cometh into the world. Go on, please. He was in the world and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own. His own received him not. Ah, the last verse. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. Shout hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The Bible says there's nothing made that he didn't make. That he made everything. There's nothing you see that he did not make. And so the one that made the world came to the world. Born through a virgin. The lady gave birth to the baby Jesus. He walked the face of the earth. He healed the sick. He casted out devils. He did all those wonderful things. And he spoke the wisdom of God in his time. And men were amazed at the kind of wisdom with which he communicated. But they didn't receive him. They didn't receive him. They didn't know he was the one that talked with Abraham. Oh, never miss your time of visitation. They didn't know he was the one in the burning bush. They talked about Abraham. They talked about Moses. They talked about the patriarchs of old. But they didn't know that the Jesus standing right before them was the one through which everything was made. They didn't know. And of course, you know what happened. And then they got him and they killed him. And they thought they had succeeded. But he already talked about his death before time. Because it was written of him. Oh, dear Lord, dear Lord, dear Lord. And then he spoke about it. He talked about it. And then he died. And then on the third day, on the third day, you know, I always like talking about Paul's account of his resurrection. Because many times we just read it that Jesus rose up on the third day. He rose up on the third day. And we're okay with that. No, it's much more than that. Paul had a revelation about it. He said, if that same spirit that rose Jesus up from the grave, meaning that Paul saw in the spirit, that the Holy Ghost walked into the tomb of Jesus and breathed upon the dead body of Jesus and then he came back to life. Then he said, if that same spirit that rose up Jesus from the grave lives in you. <laughs> ah, we have not followed cunningly devised fables, brothers and sisters. This same Holy Ghost that walked into the tomb of Jesus that same Holy Ghost that, that Jesus talked about when he said, he's with you, but he shall be in you. That same Holy Ghost is here today. Shout it, man, if you believe. It's right here. When the Holy Ghost lives inside of you, there can be no dead thing in your life. If something was dead before, it takes life. Shout hallelujah. That's what the Bible says. That when you believe in the Son of God, you have eternal life. Automatically, you have eternal life. It's given to you. Hallelujah. You have to know that you have eternal life, brothers and sisters. 
Whenever I move around, maybe in the street driving, traveling, and I see Christians, my deep seated desire is that they come to know the word. They should come to know the word. If Christians will only know the word, if they understand the word of God, will we take this world so fast? We will take it so fast. You refuse to be defeated. You refuse to be broke. You refuse to walk in darkness. Hallelujah. Then anywhere you go, the light of God shines. No room for Satan. No room for the devil. Shout hallelujah. Oh, maybe two more scriptures or so. Colossians 1 from verse 15. Say talking about Jesus. Colossians 1 from verse 15. It says, oh, oh dear Lord. Ah, maybe I have to come up to read this. I'm so full of the Holy Ghost. It says, who, just talking about Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God? It means Jesus is the body of God. He's somebody with me this morning. He said, who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. Go on, please. Hmm. I like this. He said, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. He said, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Ah, he said, I is before all things. Ah, I, I like this. He says, can, can we take this together? Verse 17, one, two, three, go. I, I like this. I like this. You know, I, I've tried to describe this several times with science. You know, the, the science will tell us that even solid shapes, for solid shapes to remain or for any uh, body to remain in this um, defined shape or thereabout, you, you have certain forces at work. And such body can be broken down into molecules and all those kind of things. You understand? All those micro stuff. And, but uh, a certain force puts them together. Right? So, but the Bible says about Jesus, he said, he, and he is before all things, right? Then he says, and by him, by him, by him, all things consist. <sighs> the scientists got to know that there is a force somewhere that holds everything together. That there is a force that holds the moon where it is, that holds the earth where it is. There is a force that puts together, that holds all these physical things we see. So that the, the world doesn't just start crashing on itself, just by itself. There is a force. But the Bible tells us, before the scientists, he said, by him, by him, all things consist. All things are held together. Ah. So there's something about the spiritual man. He sees God in everything. Hallelujah, hallelujah. By him all things consist. That force that they talk about, that is God. Holding everything together in its place. Somebody isn't getting me this morning. Are you getting what I'm talking about? In the same way too, when you follow him, when you walk with God, everything in your life is put together and arranged. Arranged. Is set in order. See, get up that realm of always praying and praying and fasting for everything. You will pray and fast. You want to go to school. You pray and fast. First of all, you want to graduate. If you want to pass your exam, you pray and fast. You want to graduate, you pray and fast. You, now you're out of school. Now you want to get a job. You pray and fast. And after that one, and the job, I need to change my job. And then you pray and fast. Then um, uh, I, I want to get married. You're praying and fasting. I mean, everything. Just... Come on. There's something I'm doing this morning. There's a grace in this place. I came to take you from that place. To a place of grace. Where in him all things consist. That even before you take an action. Two years before you will take that action. God is already preparing you. Your life can be that arranged. That's how it's supposed to be like. The Bible says that we are taking parts that he prepared beforehand. That we should walk in them. Your life is not a mistake. Don't act as though it's a mistake. 
Don't act as though you're just living like that. No, 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 no. He has planned everything. And so he's organizing everything. He said, by him, all things consist. All things consist. So when I look at things around me and I'm praying in tongues, I'm praying in tongues. I know there cannot be a problem. I'm praying in tongues. I'm praying in tongues. I know I can never have a financial issue. I'm praying in tongues. I'm praying in tongues. I know that all things work together for my good. Shout hallelujah. Because in him all things consist. Everything is arranged and set in order. Can, can we go forward a little bit? A little bit. He said, and he's the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. The last verse, last verse, last verse. He said, for it, please, oh, oh. Just talking tongues, talking tongues. Praise the Lord. I, I just need you to pray in tongues so you can receive this very well. Oh, dear Lord. Oh, no wonder Paul talked about the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, our Lord. He said, for it pleased the Father that in him, should all fullness, did he say some? No, you need, to, you need to answer now. Can you see that? He says, it pleased the Father that what? In him should all fullness dwell. The Bible is talking about God himself. And then the Father portrays it. Colossians chapter 2. Let's take it from verse 9. Colossians 2, 9. He says, for in him, in him, dwells, please don't miss this, dwells all the fullness, all the fullness. Can you remember when Jesus um, rose up from the grave? Then he appeared before the disciples. He said, all hell, all hell. And then he said, he said, all power in heaven. Oh, I love this. In earth and under the earth, he says, giving unto me. He didn't say some power. He said, all power in heaven, in earth. He says, giving unto me. The Bible says about the name of Jesus. He said that at the name of Jesus, he says, every knee should bow. Mind you, this was when he got up from the grave. Every knee should bow. Then he said, offense in heaven. Everything in heaven responds to the name of Jesus. Then he says, offense in earth. Whether it be government, whether it be rulers or thrones, no matter what boys and girls and men and the system of the government and all, he says, offense, all knees will bow. Then he says, under the earth as well. It means something happened to him when he got up from the grave. Something happened. And that's what Colossians tells us. Get back there, 2 verse 9. It says, for in him dwells all the fullness. All the fullness. All the fullness. It means all of God's authority. It means all that God is. Oh, dear Lord. Maybe we can say all that he has always been and all that he would ever be. It says, all the fullness of the Godhead. He says bodily, bodily, bodily. I told you that this is the body of God, bodily. It means that everything about God is invested in the personality Jesus. Ah, so when you're looking at looking for God, you see Jesus. Because in him dwells all the fullness. So you're looking for all the fullness of God. You see Jesus. Jesus appears to you. Glory to God. And then the big one, the big one, brothers and sisters. Oh, oh, oh. No wonder Paul said, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. The excellency. Glory to God. He says, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Some of us don't get it. Ah, oh, you need to understand this. She needs to understand this. We're running up shortly. Ah, I just feel like running. I feel like somersaulting. I feel like dancing. Oh, dear Lord, I love the scriptures. Hallelujah. I told you, we're raising a generation of people, men, women, boys, and girls, that will love the word of God, that will love Jesus with all their hearts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He says, you are complete in him. 
What does it mean? What does this scripture mean? Huh. It means what you are thinking about now. That you are trying to deny. <laughs> it means that. See, everything that you are. <sighs> the body of Christ is made up of different parts, right? So, it's saying that every part is complete in him. In this position of authority. So, you are in him. So, it means the same authority. It means the same ability. This is why we shout. It says we are complete in him. Go back to the scripture before this again. Let's take it from there again. It says, for in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Means all of God is invested in this Jesus. Right? Then it says, in him we are complete. We are in him. Tell your we are in him. So there is no part of your life that is outside. So you are in him. And all the fullness of the Godhead is invested in him. Brothers and sisters, you are not ordinary. You have to let this thing sink. That's why it's called the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because the more you know him, the more you know yourself. The revelation of Christ is the revelation of you. When you come to know this Jesus, you come to start understanding who you really are. You are searching to know him. But as you keep searching, you notice that you're just discovering yourself more and more. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, is what leaving everything to follow. It's what letting go of everything. Then you start understanding who you really are in Christ. Then you stop begging God. You stop crying. You stop the tears. You stop the war. They said there's a problem. And things are not looking okay. Stop crying. Stop begging. Stand right where you are. The fullness of the Godhead dwells in you bodily. You can speak and have your words come to pass. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. They said the business has not been working. It can work now. It will work when you come to know who you really are. Hallelujah. Then you come to know that your hands are not empty. Brothers and sisters, your hands are not empty. Whatever you lay your hands upon to do, the Bible says it will prosper. It means power comes through your hands. It's not just with the pastor. It's not just with the bishop. Hallelujah. We are a kingdom of priests. Men and women of God. Empowered by God. Empowered by divinity. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So you face life with that boldness. You face life with that confidence. You face life with that knowledge of who you are. Hallelujah. So when people talk about struggles, when they talk about problems, you, you don't, it's, it's, it's beyond just a confession to remove yourself from there. It's beyond the confession. I don't have to start confessing, oh God, I remove my name from the list of those that are poor. No, it's not a confession. It's a knowing. I'm not confessing so it will happen. I speak it because... It has happened in the spirit. So I speak what I see. I see something in the spirit and I say it. I see prosperity and I say it. I'm rich. Glory to God. I see health and I say I'm the healed in God. So no matter what is happening around, you say, oh, but you have a pain over there. Oh, there's sickness over there. No, 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 no. Looking on Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, the spies and the shame. I set my eyes on Christ. He's my perfect picture. I set my eyes on him, running the race with patience. The race that is set before me, setting my eyes on Christ. I refuse to fail. I refuse to beg. Shout hallelujah, somebody. Glory to God. In these last days, in these last days, this is what God wants. Where you stand up, you stand strong, knowing who you are in Christ. Hallelujah. We have a world presently that is plagued with a lot of things. We have issues here and there. We have poverty and lack and destruction and wars. 
We have the devil going on rampage, bringing in people that would, would, would push his agenda around the world to, to massively annihilate human population. A lot of things happening. We have false teachings, false doctrines, false signs. A lot of terrible things going on. We have governments that don't even care about the people. But this is, this is the time the Bible talks about. For the manifestation of the sons of God. This is the time. And this is how the sons of God are raised. Hallelujah. We are not putting something new into you, brothers and sisters. It's not something new we are putting into you. We are only telling you that this is who you are. See who you are. Glory to God. It's called the mirror principle. When you focus on the world, you are focusing on the mirror. Hallelujah. And then you are seeing who you are in the mirror. The physical mirror will show you how you are naturally. But the word of God as a mirror shows you who you are supposed to be or who you truly are. Glory to God. And as you focus on the mirror of God's word, you are changing. You are changing. Changing and changing gradually. Glory to God. Maybe in the mirror of God's word, you see yourself standing erect. But physically, you are not erect. But you sit in the mirror. They are supposed to stand erect. And then you stand erect. Glory to God. That's what I'm talking about. So that's what we show to you in church. We show you who you really are. So you refuse to be a beggar. That's why here we don't have counseling lines, very long lines. Like we don't have it. Because we give you the word of God. And we tell you that if the devil comes to your house, cast him out. Don't call your pastor. Cast him out. Your pastor is not your God. God lives inside of you. The authority is inside. You can control your world. You can control your life. If your life is not going in the right direction, stop where you are and say, in the name of Jesus, adjust. It will happen. Because many Christians don't believe in their own words. They don't believe in what they carry. They would rather believe in others instead. I know if brother A prays for me, everything will be fine. No, 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 a thousand times no. These are the last days. You have to be strong on your own. You have to be powerful on your own. That's why you should come to church to hear the word of God. Then you know who you really are. You can apply the word of God wherever you are. He said, uh, there's someone that is dying in your compound. And now you're moving around. Let me call him for help. And now you're picking up your phone to call somebody that is far away to pray. No, 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 no. The Bible says, this sign shall follow them that believe. This sign shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall drive out demons. They drive out demons. They lay hands on the sick and they recover. They cast out devils. Shout hallelujah, brothers and sisters. Glory to God. Glory to God. Yes, I'm running up now. You know, many times when I move around and I, I hear people praying and saying things that are not, that, 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 that do not describe the word of God. Maybe singing songs of defeat. It may even be a church. And I hear that song and just sounds coming out. Or probably uh, somebody talking with God's children and telling them things and make them feel small and make them feel like uh, uh, they are begging God as though God is far away. It, it moves my heart. It moves my heart. And I've been praying about this for a long time. A long time. A long time. And I, I was talking to a certain group of young pastors and I, I told them something. I, I said, I, I can be described also, this is some time ago, as the voice of one that mourns Mourning the death of something. But of course, with the hope of a resurrection of the truth, of the word of God, that will lead a generation of truth and fire. Glory to God. Getting out of the deception of evil. How will a Christian think God is far? Now when they pray, they think it has to go through the roof. No. No. And why do we have doctrines and teachings that make people feel like God is so far away from them? God isn't far away, brothers and sisters. He's not far. He's closer than the person sitting down close to you even now. He's closer. Many times it's just the sound of that still small voice in your heart, in your spirit. 
Many times it's that noise you feel within your spirit that is God. And what he wants from you is to listen to him. Because he will not strive for so long with man, the Bible says. But you would have to listen. You would have to listen. You would have to acknowledge him. That's why Jesus said, talking about the communion, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Because many have forgotten him, but they think they remember him. They don't remember him. They've forgotten the truth, forgotten him. He said, do this in remembrance of me. How God wants us to keep his thoughts in our minds every time. To always have his thoughts in our minds. When we go through life, to have his thoughts at all times. To think about him at all times. Let Jerusalem come to your mind, brothers and sisters. You think about him at all times. You make a commitment to think about him at all times. Hallelujah. He's not far away. He's not. He's not. God is so close. Closer than the breath in your nostrils. He's so close. And maybe the, the, you, you, it doesn't matter where you are. You get into your room and you're crying about something. He's right there with you. But what he wants you to do is to listen to him and put to work the word. When you put to work the word, what you have to do is to be patient, hoping on the word of God. The only hope we have is God's word. Don't act as though there's some other hope somewhere. If there's some other hope somewhere, there's no need preaching. This is all. Jesus is all. He's everything. He's everything. And many are often afraid to commit themselves to Christ. You see, if I, if I get committed to Christ, hope I will not lose this, I will not lose that. Of course, the Bible says you take up your cross and follow him every day. But you don't lose anything. You don't lose anything when you follow Jesus. You don't. Rather, you gain. It's great gain, brothers and sisters. It's great gain. At one time, we felt we lost a lot. But for me and some of my friends, we just kept focusing on God's word. And it was looking as though we lost so much. But truly, it wasn't a loss. It was great gain. Until I read the scripture, the Bible says that if you leave father, mother, money, house, lands, and everything for my sake, he said, here in this life, here in this life, he didn't say in heaven. He didn't say in heaven, brothers and sisters. Glory to God. That is why I always talk to those that are pursuing money. You pursue money, you don't come to church. Always pursuing money. You cannot get it like that. Your service to God is important. Your commitment to Christ is important. When you pursue it, you don't get it. The Bible says that when you let go of all these things, and you focus on him, he said, all these things are added unto you. He says, it comes in a hundredfold. A hundredfold. Multiplied. It means that before I kneel down to pray, he hears me. I'm like, dear Lord, I kneel down to pray. I need a million. I get 10 million. I said, oh, I need a 10 million. I get a hundred million. Brothers and sisters, it's God's grace. I'm just talking to somebody right now because that's going to be your experience this year. In the mighty name of Jesus, it would happen. It would happen. God already showed to us how that some of us here, we are busting. If, you, if you're not in the level of the millions, you're busting into the level of the millions. You're busting in there. That's what's going to happen. We have prayed. We've seen it in the spirit. It will happen in your life this year. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It will happen. Yes. Increase everywhere. It's the year of the prolific church. Shout hallelujah. And as I'm talking to you right now, praying the Holy Ghost. Praying the Holy Ghost. Praying tongues. Praying the Spirit. Whatever you are, please just rise up and pray in the Holy Ghost. It's time to prophesy, to speak the word. To speak the word. Yes.
many haven't really asked, what does God want? Many only talk about, I want God to do this for me. I want God to do that for me. I want God to change the whole course of my life. I want God to bless my family, my business, my career. But have you asked, what does God want? When you meet his needs, you will not have a need. You can live a life of excellence. You can live a life of continuous manifestations of the Holy Ghost. 24 hours a day, 7 days in a week. Glory to God. That's where I live. God is trying to pass on to us a mindset. Your mindset controls you. Your mindset determines the quality of your life in the present. And it will determine the quality of your future. Your mindset. Your mindset is simple. It's how your mind is set. <laughs> That's it. It's the same thing. It's how, how is your mindset? So, God here is dealing with our mindset. It means your heart should be after Him alone, not after any other thing. The Bible says He's a jealous God. Don't seek something else. Don't pursue something else. Let it be Him. And everything about your life, from your education, your career, your business, your family, and everything must be hinged on Him. The book of Corinthians said that they that live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto Him that died for them. Glory to God. God wants you to be addicted to Him. God wants you to always think about him. God 